with, and I probably would say uh, it's relational. I think myself and a lot of Indigenous researchers and scholars would feel it unethical to do relationships. Uh, so the investment of time and energy is needed often before the whole uh, research process um, begins. You know, sometimes I know in research world we say participatory uh, research, and, I, and it certainly does fit for uh, Indigenous peoples uh, because uh, there is that saying, nothing about us without us, and that there's been a lot of um, colonial harms, but that's why it has to be uh, relationship oriented. You know, I guess maybe this is a good, I mean, there's so much now written about the uh, harms that have been done to Indigenous peoples, um, not just through colonization and uh, invasion, dispossession and controls, um, but by researchers. And sometimes even still now, but um, for example, um, Western researchers would go into communities because they wanted to research something, not fully checking in with the people to enlist their support or whatever, but they would go in and get somebody's agreement. Um, but then they would leave and never give the results to the people or to um, in, ask the people if the interpretation of the results reflects accurately with them. You know, again, back to some of the research that's happened is you know, they have been told one reason for why a research project would happen. And so it might have, they might have been knowing it was, okay, we're going to test your blood work for your le the level of diabetes amongst Indigenous people in this part of the geographical region or whatever. But there was also an underhanded um, second motive for the research. So the blood samples were actually used in this particular case um, with the, um, the Hapsui people of Arizona with regard to um, looking at uh, schizophrenia and other mental health conditions. And the Indigenous people didn't know that, didn't know that. And I think Indigenous scholars are very aware of these harms that have come to Indigenous peoples worldwide. And so ethically, I have to go beyond. some research projects with Indigenous peoples and one that is kind of controversial and uh, it is with uh, a police, uh, uh, actually Waterloo Regional Police Corps and an Indigenous women and girls drum circle. I happened to be, you know, where a place where I had previously worked, um, they had all of these community booths set up in the hall and so lots of just different um, titles on their posters and stuff. And then I saw the word chorus and it caught my attention. And then I looked down at the table and it was the police. I thought, oh, okay, and I just kept on walking um, because I couldn't have imagined actually having a connection with the police when I know of the extraordinary violence that police have committed against indigenous peoples, particularly indigenous women and girls. But then something stopped me in my tracks. And I believe actually Creator stopped me because it wasn't in my mind to stop. And so I turned and the man at the table was looking directly at me. So then I thought, oh, okay, we've locked eyes. And so I think I need to go over and say something. And it, I went very awkwardly said, oh, what, you see? Of course, this chorus sings, but I ended up learning something by going to the table. And uh, not only about the police chorus, that uh, they go out into community, they do outreach with various um, people in community in different ways and sing for different community events. But they had never done one with Indigenous peoples and, and he had a sense why this might not happen, um, but he didn't know how to shift it. 
and he said we would love to have some kind of a partnership with uh, Indigenous peoples. We just don't know how to make it happen. He said, would you ever be interested in a partnership of singing? And I hesitated and I said, that's a tough ask. Um, but I, he gave me his card and I said, I'll, I'll take this back to the women and girls and get back to you. Not really thinking I would get back to him, but I, uh, I did present it to the drum circle and the girls, you know, who were at the time between 10 and 14 years old. And we had little kids and babies too. Um, but I, uh, I said that this had transpired and just explained the story to them. And I said, is this even something we want to entertain at all? And, um, and some started to think and they said, I don't know. And others said, well, why not? Maybe it could help. And I said, well, why do you think it could help? And they said, well, we would wish for better relations with our, with our kids and our grandkids than what's there now. Maybe something good could come out of it. So he came to another meeting and uh, there was a really awkward silence. And um, he came with one of his, uh, one of the other police corps members. And so it began a bit of sharing. And we actually did that a number of times. It was a bit of back and forth where they would come, a few of the men would come to the women's drum circle. And then we would go to the police corps and we did some teachable moments but also we would do songs. Um, they would sing a song and we would sing a song and then we asked if they would sing one of our songs. We need to actually come together and just sit down and get to know each other um, outside of our roles as any singers and, um, you know, and then to share while we are sharing food with one another. So to share more teachings, more stories in that process. So I had ethical considerations in the research itself, but also in the submission of an ethics um, review with the uh, committee people. I felt like I had to do the whole uh, application process twice, um, <laughs> you know, because I answered it the way that I knew that I was being ethical. And um, so there were questions coming from the institution that either needed clarification or challenged me on my ethical right. ways. So um, example of this that's <clears throat> most significant to me is I would not have done the research if I didn't have relationships with all of the people, mm. including the women and girls and the police corps. I actually had to get to know them all and there were 70 of them. <laughs> and, and in our jump circle, um, probably at the time that we, that the actual research studies happened, we had about 25 of our women and girls so it was a lot of getting to know each other um, through that process and uh, and it takes it takes a lot of effort and I think for me to ask people to be in a research project they could only answer me if they knew me because otherwise how do they know that they would trust that this information is going to be used in a good way and that is helpful for the people and so that was really important for me to know in my research is if they said yes to the research and i said so why are you saying yes to the research i actually wanted to know this and they said because we know you kelly we know that if you're saying um, that you're asking for us to be part of this research, that is, it is important, we think it's important, but you're gonna do right by us. And if I hadn't had that relationship, I know that the indigenous women and girls in particular would not have agreed to it. So I think it just affirms for me how important relationship building is there. But on the ethics review, with the university, they talk about um, neutrality and objectivity, and that the researcher is outside of their 
research subjects and they said that they considered it unethical that I knew all my participants. And I said, well, it's completely unethical that I would do any research if I didn't know the people. And I said, because I know them all, I'm up to a higher level of ethics because I have to do right by them all the way through the research. If I don't or if I've harmed them, my relationship with them is, is ruined. So ownership, control, access, and possession, mm -hmm. and um, and it it's around Indigenous peoples have to have ownership of the data and any information uh, related to them, and they and as you just mentioned that you know around self determination, so, so and sovereignty over that information, as well as uh, control of how the information is used. So being fully informed, what is the intent of this, this research project? How is the information going to be used? Where is it going to be stored? I made access of the research findings to everybody in my research study. And I also asked them for feedback. And so we actually had sharing circles where I would say, this is what I've got gathered from your transcripts. And what, do you, what sense are you making out of this? I didn't want to make the interpretation yes, of the data because yes. that's a colonial harm because mm -hmm. we can come in with our Western lens and interpret, but we're actually to interpreting it through how we know the world to be um, and not how the people uh, see it. And I can't even presume to think that I understand another people outside of myself. Um, so I have to ask them, you know, how is this meaningful? What does this mean to you? So those were really important. You know, I wanted these people to stay in my life and to keep these relationships that were there. Um, to elevate just one kind of knowledge is actually, I don't think is good diligence on the part of an institution, even to recognize that knowledge is not just through research and literature, but knowledge comes from community people. And uh, yes, one of the areas that I also had to, I was challenged on in my research with the ethics people is that knowledge would be coming through dreams, through smudging, um, through ceremony, through fasting on the land. We did lots of that and, or through drumming. And so they said, well, that's not a proven knowledge base. And I said, but we already know it is. Um, and so there was a lot of back and forth. So I had to, it's still challenging because I find I have to talk the language um, of an institution for them to understand, especially when they hold power to say yes or no, like funders, um, as well as ethical ethics review bodies. There's some changes, but there's a long ways to go. The ethical thing I think is we have to start with ourselves mm -hmm. is knowing who we are and our identity tracing our ancestry back and how did we if we are settler how did we arrive to the land you know settler is a contested word um, you know because people may have had family here for generations but in the end people have come here through enslavement and also refugee and other you know harmful experiences that they are fleeing from to come here. But there is a point when people settle here on this land and make it their home, that they become complicit in the ongoing colonization that's here. And so unless we become part of the decolonial um, TRC project, we're still kind of reaffirming colonization um, for that. So. Um, being non-Indigenous means we've come from somewhere else. And so that that acknowledgement, I think, is so important for how we enter into relationships with Indigenous peoples. And I'm still seeing students who talk about not having much exposure to Indigenous peoples, like to actual people. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a colonial thing too, to 
not see oneself in relation to indigenous peoples um, and uh, so to they, they also don't know the history very well or to they may not understand how is the history connected to them i think that could help build better relationships yes